have Mr. Norm Jenkins, President of Capstone Development and NABHUD Board. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon. We're running about 23 minutes behind. Gee whiz. You know, that's what happens when you have all these important people in the room. I've never seen sort of a, a mass exodus to chase down Chris Nassetta. He must, you're some rock star, Chris. Jeez. And then we've we got a Hall of Fame basketball player. Isaiah walked in. There's a big crowd following him. And got some of the preeminent hotel developers. I saw Don Peoples here. So a lot of, lot of power in the room. Uh, welcome to the NABHUD Scholarship and Awards Luncheon. I'm Norm Jenkins, president of Capstone Development. Uh, for over 100 years, Hilton has represented excellence in hospitality. And on, on behalf of NABHUD, we are pleased to have you as our sponsor. As a Hilton owner and franchisee, I can say without reservation that Hilton has been and continues to be an outstanding partner. So thank you. Uh, we have a full agenda and we're running a little bit behind schedule, so we're gonna have remarks from uh, a couple of dignitaries, uh, beginning with Dana Young, president of Visit Florida. Dana? Thank you, and uh, thank you, Norm, and thank you, Andy, for having me here at this NABHUD meeting. Um, welcome to Florida. Uh, Florida, we are very biased here. We uh, love our state, and fortunately, I have the privilege of being the president and CEO of Visit Florida, which is our state's destination marketing organization. And I'm going to keep it quick because I know you're behind, but there's a couple of uh, statistics that you should know. Uh, in 2018, Florida welcomed a, a record 125 million visitors. So we are on a roll here in Florida and we just had a record quarter. So with your help in the tourism industry, we will continue to create uh, millions of jobs in the state of Florida. And in fact, uh, last year, uh, tourism added 86 billion with a B dollars to our Florida economy. Um, a few very relevant figures that um, you might find interesting is that uh, we found at Visit Florida that people are twice as likely to visit our state if they see our advertising. In the African American community, that rises to three times. So that is a huge deal for us at Visit Florida. Uh, we incorporate diversity in every campaign we do, uh, but we are doing a few things that specifically recognize the importance of the African American community. Uh, we are the number one tourist destination for African American travelers, and uh, we were so proud to get several of our sites on the Civil Rights Trail last year. So uh, while you're here, I hope you spend a lot of money uh, eat in a lot of restaurants, uh, enjoy your time, but again, spend a lot of money, and um, hopefully you will come back, and I just hope you have uh, a wonderful rest of your meeting, and thank you for having me. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dana. Uh, next, we'll hear uh, remarks from the Honorable Francis Suarez, the mayor of the city of Miami. And I will also uh, respect the tardiness of my remarks. So I just want to say uh, that it's really remarkable and wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, it's a tremendous energy that I felt from the minute that I arrived on property. Uh, incredible, incredibly special friends that I've gotten to know over the years. Um, and I'm very proud of what we have become as a city. I was sharing with Isaiah, uh, you know, in one of the rooms that my first year as mayor, we hit a 51-year low in homicides. 51-year low. So to put that number, yes. By the way, that number is not adjusted for population growth. So 50 years ago, there was significantly less people in the city of Miami than there are today. So it's something we're very proud of. To put the number in context, I'm 41. So it is the safest year in my lifetime to be in Miami and was my first year as mayor. So. Second thing I want to emphasize is last year we did $3 billion in new construction. $3 billion last year alone. And to put that number in context, there are 34 cities in Dade County. The next largest amount was $800 million. So it's less than, you know, one-third of what we did last year. So the city has grown by 10.5% last year alone. And we are doubling down. 
We're doubling down by reducing our property taxes. We're going to be reducing them hopefully this September. Thank you. You can clap for that in New York. Particularly the New Yorkers happen to, uh, for some reason, be clapping about a reduction in property taxes. Now, I have no idea why. But it is a 30-year low in property taxes and our property tax rate. And so we're very uh, blessed and honored uh, to have that. We are obviously an incredibly rich and diverse community and it's something that we emphasize, whether it's uh, through uh, supporting uh, African-American history in the city of Miami. We just uh, passed a resolution accepting from the county $20 million to create an African-American museum at Virginia Key Beach, a historically black uh, beach in the city of Miami, something that we're incredibly proud of. Uh, we've restored a Lyric Theater in historic Overtown and we expanded our trolley system in one of our uh, impoverished areas in Liberty City. And so that's another accomplishment that we are incredibly proud of in the city of Miami. We are building a global brand. And that brand is one where we want to guarantee a pathway to prosperity for all of our citizens. We want to give them each an opportunity to succeed. We know government cannot equalize uh, things for everyone, but it can create the conditions so that everyone can be successful. And that's my objective, whether it be from education, whether it be the child savings account, which we uh, have initiated for every single kindergartner in the city of Miami will have a child savings account so that they can learn how to save money and be fiscally responsible. Whatever the initiative is, we're gonna be at the forefront. We're gonna be the most progressive city on affordable housing. Uh, Don has, has been wonderful as a partner in some of the developments that he has, has undertaken here in the city and in Miami Beach. And we're very proud to have him here. And he was talking to me about another uh, potential project that we may have in the city, 19 acres at a uh, city property that we're thinking of developing. And that that news is reaching all the way up to New York. What a coincidence. So uh, we want to be, we want to continue to stress uh, our growth, our low tax environment, our diversity, and of course, we want to be the most resilient city on the planet so that your children's grandchildren can rely on the city of Miami being here for the next 100 years of Hilton. So thank you so much, and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a proclamation here for Christopher. Come on up, Chris. We are proclaiming today Christopher Nasetta Day in the city of Miami in commemoration of the 100-year history of Hilton. Do you want me to say anything? Yeah. yeah. All right. Andy wants me to be brief because you've had enough of me. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. While Hilton is a very big global company, it's 6,000 hotels in 115 countries, we're only as strong as every individual hotel and every individual community and our ability to be part of that community. We have been part of the Miami community for over 50 years. Um, it's an extraordinary community, one that we take great pride in our involvement uh, in a city where we work and live and travel. Um, we look forward, we appreciate the recognition, and we certainly look forward to expanding our presence here and contributing even more to your fabulous community. Thank you. Um, the um, Asian American Hotel Association has been a, a partner of NABHOOD since the very beginning. Uh, in fact, AHOA actually helped uh, to establish NABHOOD many years ago. So we, next we'll hear remarks from Jagruti Panwala, the chairwoman of the Asian American Hotel Association, please. Thank you very much, and uh, once again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I am the current chairwoman of the Asian American Hotel Owner Association. For those of you who are not familiar with AHOA, I do see a lot of familiar faces, but the association is growing. 
we have over 18,500 hoteliers who are members of this association, and our members own 50% of all the hotels in the United States. It is an incredible, incredible journey for the Ahoa because it's been only 30 years since the association was formed. Working with NABUT, working with Latino Hotel Association, and AHRLA, all the different associations that do, we work with, we recognize that we are stronger together, and we're gonna continue this path um, in the future, and of course, making sure that we're providing the values to all of our hoteliers. As being a hotelier, somebody like me, who owns six properties in a tri-state area, uh, I know the struggle of having the right team. So today, we're recognizing somebody very special who's a very much of a deserving of this award. So let me just say a little bit about her. This year's recipient of the Outstanding Hotelier Award is Cassandra Levy, the general manager of the Clarion Inn and Suites Atlanta downtown. The hotel formerly the Castleberry Inn and Suites built by H.J. Russell has significant meaning to the city of Atlanta and to his children who still own to this day. Cassandra's leadership inspires her associates to strive for greatness, her work with the rate
30 for 30 bad boys video. Yeah. And you notice when he was in Detroit, he yeah. was all right. He was normal. Yeah, he was normal. Yeah. And then he went to Chicago. Yeah. And that's all I got to say. <laughs> As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> Thanks, Isaiah. Appreciate it. Uh, finally, next we'll hear from the Honorable Zane De Silva, the Bermuda Minister of Tourism. Good afternoon, everyone. In Bermuda, when we get a soft good afternoon return, we always ask again. So good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, Isaiah, um, I'm sorry to say this, but I just happen to be a um, Chicago fan. And I was happy when Rodman came over to us. <laughs> American writer and political commentator Mark Twain once wrote, you can go to heaven if you want. I'd rather stay in Bermuda. I am Zane DeSova, the Minister of Tourism and Transport in Bermuda. Before I begin, I want to ask everyone one question. How many of you have been to Bermuda? Wow, that's quite a lot. Because my next question was going to be, if not, why not? I don't know if many of you know, but we are very incredibly close to your East Coast gateway cities. We are only 680 miles off the coast of North Carolina with direct flights from Atlanta, Boston, London, Miami, New York, and we have seasonal flights from Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and Newark, just 90 minutes from the East Coast. For those of you from New York, it's faster to get to Bermuda than it is to drive to the Hamptons. <laughs> Bermuda is only one of three countries in the region that offer U.S. pre-clearance. That means that you don't have to endure the long lines and long waits at U.S. Customs when you land. You just pick up your bags and move. We are clean, we are safe, and those of you who have been to Bermuda can confirm this. Bermudians are the friendliest people you ever want to meet. Every once in a while, tourists will lose their wallet, misplace their cell phones, or some other valuable item. It is not unusual for that wallet that phone or that valuable item to be safely returned. It is not unusual for a visitor who is lost, not only given directions, but perhaps a lift to where they are going and an impromptu personal tour. Friendliness, warmth, caring for our visitors, that's the Bermudian way. Now next week, we will be celebrating Cup Match for those that don't know, Cup Match in Bermuda is a four-day weekend making the emancipation of slaves, marking the emancipation of slaves in Bermuda. If you haven't booked your ticket yet, it's not too late. It's without a doubt one of the greatest cultural and sporting experiences you will ever witness. Just make sure you set aside some time beforehand to rest and a little time after the event to recover. On your next visit, or your next return visit, you will find that we have an inventory of 2,400 hotel rooms, with roughly 1,000 rooms in development. And our goal is to have 4,000 to 4,500 rooms in the very near future. Bermuda's new state-of-the-art airport, scheduled to open next July, will feature upgraded airport systems and procedures to ensure that on arrival, our guests will enjoy a frictionless entry experience into Bermuda. The government of Bermuda is focused on hotel development and investment. This focus has given us pleasure 
of having a core, Fairmont, Marriott, Rich Reserve, and St. Regis, Rosewood, and just last week, Hilton Tapestry Brands operating on the island. So welcome to Bermuda Hilton. Like any successful businesses, our government applies a progressive, forward-thinking approach to tourism investment. This is why Bermuda enacted the Tourism Investment Act 2017, which outlines investor incentives for tourism-focused projects. The act makes Bermuda's offering to investors transparent and reduces government involvement, therefore reducing the old dreaded red tape. Additionally, Bermuda is creating a concierge service in several key complementary areas, such as immigration, stakeholder engagement, and marshalling resources. For African Americans, Bermuda represents an investment opportunity for you in an investment that is safe, culturally rich, welcomes you, and wants you to be a part of our community. Bermuda is excited to have opportunities available for future developments, both public and private. The government-owned Bermuda Land Development Company has several sites, including Daniel's Head, which it continues to market. Private owners also have sites with investment opportunities, and I would be happy to introduce anyone to these potential opportunities. And Kyle Leipman, who is here with me today, the Building Development Manager at the Bermuda Business Development Agency, is also here and available to assist with all your questions. Now, if you all don't know Kyle, if you've seen anyone, I think I've only seen one person today with Bermuda shorts. Kyle, you want to come up and just say hi? Come up quickly, Kyle, come on. This is my brother, Kyle Thompson. Thank you, Kyle, thank you. Yes, he is. Kyle's trying to get me to wear Bermuda shorts. I said, well, I'm going to give it some thought. <laughs> oh, and by the way, the little, that little Bermuda triangle problem, we've solved that. <laughs> As comedian Stephen Wright said, the Bermuda triangle got tired of the warm weather. It moved to Alaska. Now Santa Claus is missing. <laughs> In closing, Bermuda is open for hospitality business. We are committed to growing the tourism economy through investment, sales, and marketing. And again, Isaiah, I'll finish here. I think you talked about your champagne, and you talked about sun, soil, and grapes. Our champagne in Bermuda is sun, sand, and our Bermudian people. Thank you. <laughs> Norm, thanks thank you. very much. Thank you very much. It doesn't work. OK, finally, we're going to uh, hear from Hilton, uh, today's sponsor, but Andy alluded to this yesterday in his remarks. Uh, NABHUD is all about diversity and inclusion, but when you sort of think in terms of companies that have had a significant impact in diversity and inclusion, Hilton sort of bubbles up to the top, and most of you may or may not know, but uh, Hilton appointed Bob Johnson to their board of directors, I'd say 20 some odd years ago. He's the first African American billionaire, and uh, they needed a diverse voice at the table, which worked out well. That coincided with, with, with my good friend Tom Baltimore was an executive with Hilton. He had been tapped to come to Hilton by Chris's uh, predecessors, and uh, he got the opportunity to present to the board of directors. He and Bob Johnson formed an outstanding relationship, and as a result of that, they decided to form RLJ. Hilton allowed Tom to work weekends and, and evenings while he was still an executive with uh, Hilton to form that company. Uh, 15 or 20 years later, uh, when Hilton orchestrates their spinoff of uh, Park Hotels, Chris taps Tom Baltimore to become the CEO of Park Hotels. So, so those are some significant, call them transformational moves, all from one company. So. I'm really proud that Hilton is sponsoring today's luncheon, and we'll call up uh, Glenn Girk to make remarks on, uh, on behalf of our, our sponsor. Glenn?
Good afternoon, everybody. As a second generation Hilton employee, my mom would be extraordinarily proud for me to be here representing Hilton at the Nabhood Convention. I've been attending Nabhood for about 10 years with Bill Fortier throughout the years, and the group has grown tremendously. And I compliment Andy for growing the group, networking in the group, connecting people. I was thrilled last night for us to host a function at the Gabriel Hotel by Curio, hosted by Raul Thomas, who I hope is in the room today, who bought a beautiful hotel into the Hilton system. And it's fabulous to have that hotel owned proudly by a NAB Hood member. With lunch, I'd like to take a brief moment to say thank you to the people in the room who are serving us our beverages and our food here at the Marriott and for their hospitality. <laughs> to be here with NABHood, it's a great honor, great pleasure to be a part of Hilton and supporting the group, enjoying the lunch. It's a big year for Hilton, as you know. It's a hundredth year that the company has been in existence. And this year, the company was named as the top employer in the United States by Fortune magazine. And what is hugely impressive is to have the gentleman who runs the company here at NABHood showing support for the organization, the people uh, that make this organization great. So I thank NABHood for their support of Hilton, and I'm proud that Hilton supports NABHood. Thank you all and have a, enjoy the rest of your lunch. Thanks, Glenn, and thank you to the entire uh, Hilton team. Uh, typically, we take a break. We started a little late, so we're going to roll right into our award ceremony. So please uh, continue to eat. Andy reminded me that we didn't say a prayer before we started eating. Uh, I'm a deacon at a Baptist church. I already prayed for all y'all, so you're good. Don't worry about it. We're all covered. So, Andy? Hey. Thank you, Norm. Thank you very much. Good job, Norm. You get to do it again next year as we grow the market. Our awards. First young lady, an historic hotel, an historic family, H.J. Russell, a giant in the Atlanta community. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage the AHOA Outstanding Hotelier Award, which is a collaboration between us and AHOA, Cassandra Levy, General Manager at the Clarion Inn and Suites, Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> Vinay? So Brian and, and, um, has worked tirelessly to make sure that happened. His commitment with Lester to ensure that we have great choice products. The next one is the NABA Chairman's Award. For those of you that don't know Steve Joyce, you've got to get to know him. Steve has always been a great supporter of NABA, his days at um, Marriott and his days at Choice. And now he's at IHOP and Appleby and Dine equity, it's a, glo dying global. it's a global brand. Anytime you call Steve, you know him, and Chris knows Steve, he always has something funny. I picked up the phone, I said, hey Steve, I've been trying to reach you. He said, bull, and I'll stop right there. <laughs> My friend, Steve Joyce, please join me.
Being from the Caribbean, we did not have a lot of role models in the hotel industry except all the maids and the doormen. We didn't see owners. We didn't see executives. And so growing up in the Bahamas and Jamaica, my parents forbid me to get into the hotel industry. Like Chris, I was supposed to go to law school. I'm glad I didn't. But we had a bright light. We had somebody that left the, the trail, the crumbs for the trail. And that became our trailblazer. Ladies and gentlemen, please join in me in bringing to the stage Sir, Sir, knighted by the Queen, Royston Hopkins, KCMG. Sir Hopkins? I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask his lovely wife, Betty, can you join us to the stage? I know you don't like to do this, but you know, Betty made it possible for you to yeah. do this. Betty, please join us up here. Um, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, just, I've been given four minutes by the boss. Um, I started my journey 55 years ago, just like most of you in this room, with my parents running a 12-room inn, my mother being one of the pioneers of what we now know as Caribbean fusion, and my father was the man outside. And all I understood growing up in that hotel with my brothers and sisters was the meaning of hospitality. The journey continued along, and I eventually got one bankrupt hotel, then I moved on to another one, which I'm proud to say I don't have much time, but I'm proud to say it's an inspiration in that I'm the only, we have, um, we've attained the AAA five diamond status, and I'm proud to stay here or stand in front of you to say that in the Caribbean, I'm one of seven AAA five diamonds, and in the whole five, five diamond cat category of 121, I'm the only black independently owned AAA five diamond hotel on planet Earth. This makes me very proud, and it makes me also very proud to receive the Trailblazer Award because I hope it works as an um, inspiration for, as a former speaker said, for those of us who are coming along to know that it can be done. Thank you very much. Huge companies like Hilton do great jobs on land, in the ocean. Huge companies like Royal Caribbean do great things. In the Caribbean, we, ha we have a hotel industry and we have a cruise industry. I'm proud of the work that Royal Caribbean has done in terms of bringing more diversity to their executive team. And my good friend, Russell, there's Russell. Russell, hold your hand up. Russell left Miami-Dade County to go to work for Royal Caribbean. But what's more important, as they charter the Caribbean, they continue to provide opportunities for young Caribbean individuals, no matter what country they're in, and it's a sign of great leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the stage the president of Royal Caribbean Cruise Line, Michael Bailey. Mike, please join us. I'm gonna ask Clay from the Ministry of Tourism, Clay Saunders, where's Clay Saunders? And the chairman of the Bahamas Gaming Board, Kenyatta Gibson, please join me. Clay Saunders is in the room.
So Andy, thank you very much for this great honor. From the 75,000 employees of Royal Caribbean, I'm uh, pleased to accept this award. Royal Caribbean started 50 years ago this year, formed in the Caribbean. It's our main activity in terms of our business. We're now a global company with brands literally all over the world. We carry almost 8 million guests a year on our ships across Asia, the Caribbean, Europe, Latin America, literally all over the world. It's interesting because Royal Caribbean from the very beginning was incredibly diverse and um, really was founded on the Caribbean. In fact, I would say probably from the very first day, we were this wonderfully diverse group of individuals that collectively came together and with a focus on our roots from the Caribbean, have grown and grown, and it's all based upon the strength of the diversity of our entire group of employees and all 75,000 of them. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope you have a nice uh, day today. Thank you. And now, Last night, where I lost my voice. How do you take a hotel in Miami and make it a success? I knew one guy before the guy that's doing it now called Don Peoples, but Don left a trail for guys like Raul Thomas and his team to come back and create downtown Miami in a hotel from another, didn't do very well, but he had the good fortune to understand to partner with a star brand that have turned that whole hotel around. The deal of the year, the Napa deal of the year, is called the Gabriel Miami Curio Collection by Hilton. Please join me in recognizing my good friend, Raul Thomas, the owner of the Gabriel Hotel. Vern, Vern, can you join me on stage, please? Your lovely wife, please. Raul, can you have your wife join us? Glenn, Chris, Bill, no? Okay. Thank you, everyone. I wanted to say thank you to Andy and to Nab Hood for this incredible award. Uh, the Gabriel is about family and faith. In Hebrew, Gabriel means God is my faith. And the Gabriel name is actually the youngest of my children. So I think we get up with a purpose and a love and a commitment to this hotel. It's been a journey of five years. I have so many people to thank along the way. Uh, Vern Perry and his team at Strategic Partners for believing in his vision. Uh, MSD Capital, Michael Dell for the acquisition that we made in 2014. Uh, my team for their tireless support and commitment in believing in a bigger picture, making everything that's impossible possible. Um, if I can give any message to entrepreneurs out there that want to follow our path, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a view to tireless effort, commitment, uh, high ground in terms of your moral compass, and believing in something greater than just you and the dollar. Thank you so much, and it's been a privilege. Andy, thank you, Chris, Vern, my team, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Raul and I have been collaborating on providing an education component to the students throughout our community. 
and we've selected Florida Memorial College to be our scholarship recipient school. Thank you, Raul. Thank you. Thank you for that, thank and thank, thank you for your commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. How do you introduce a guy that doesn't know how to say no? Doesn't know how to take no? That is focused on getting the deal done. Think about it. Mandela came to Miami and um, there was an issue and Don raised his hand and said I can do it when nobody else could. I first met Don Don in an automotive dealership and Federal Highway in Hollywood where some, an elected official said, you gotta meet this guy from DC. Okay, an elected official tell you that you go. And he said, I get into the hotel business and the city had agreed as part of the boycott settlement to put an African American owned hotel. And as I said, many people have tried, they couldn't get it done. But let me say this thing about Don. He's smart because he married a beautiful young lady called Katrina. Katrina, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. I gotta tell you this one joke. So Don said, I got this hotel in Miami. We convinced him to go up to Fort Lauderdale to try to build another hotel. What a complete disaster. We tried, we tried. They found every possible reason not to get the deal done. We're going into a meeting one day. I believe I'd spoken to Katrina. She called, I don't remember the story quite clearly, but she said, keep an eye on Don. Well, you've got to keep an eye on Don. And we knew this was going to go south. We had a couple of elected officials that kept trying to stop him. And one kept saying, we want to see these documents. And I'm sitting behind Don in the chambers, and I said, oh my God. And then he got up, he said, Commissioner, when you ask all those other rich guys to see their documents, then I'll show you mine. But if you want to see them, come to my office and do it. Because obviously, you put it in the public preview, everybody gets to see it, and it's being used as an excuse. Again, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming my friend to the stage, the trailblazer, the man who made Miami the first African-American owned hotel on South Beach, my good friend, Don Peoples. Well, good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank Andy for that kind uh, introduction. Also, I want to recognize the good work that Andy has done. I mean, he embarked on a journey um, when he uh, formed this organization um, to create more diversity within the hospitality industry, um, which definitely needs more diversity. And, um, and he's been a champion for African-American entrepreneurs all over the country. And it's not easy to put together a conference like this and to keep it going and to attract some of the most talented minds in the hospitality and development industry from around the country to come to Miami in late July of all times. And only Andy could do that. So let's give Andy a round of applause for the great work he's doing. Now I just got here earlier this afternoon, so I don't know what was said about Norm Jenkins, but I want to say something about Norm Jenkins. Norm Jenkins was a champion um, for decades to provide economic opportunity in the hospitality industry for African Americans. He led the charge at Marriott to make sure that Marriott has led the industry every year since the NAACP has issued its report card as being the top grade winner because in terms of diversity and economic opportunities for African Americans. And Norm, after leaving Marriott, I don't know how he could have topped what he had done, but he built the largest hotel in Washington, D.C., the Marriott Marquis Hotel. So Norm, I want to thank you very much for all you've done to create a better environment for me and all of us to do business.
We heard from uh, Mayor Francis Suarez, and Francis has left, but he is one of the most young and dynamic new mayors of the nation. Miami is an exciting global city, and he's going to take it to the next level, and he is one of the few father and son teams in politics where the son follows a great mayor and is an even greater mayor, and Francis is going to do some really great things. You all will hear much more about him in the years to come. Also, I want to just compliment Andy for being able to get so many New Yorkers here. I mean, I mean, this is incredible. I'm seeing people. I'm in New York a lot. By the way, not 183 days, but I'm in New York. So, and I spent a lot of time there, but not 183 days. But I, you know, I've been trying to catch up with my lawyer and friend for weeks, and I see him right over here at the table next to me, Daryl Gay. Uh, and he's sitting next to Craig Livingston, who happens to be a phenomenal developer, but also chairman of the New York Real Estate Chamber, which is an organization of African-American real estate developers in New York City. And we want him to also come down here and bring his talents to South Beach like LeBron did and do many things down here. So New York is going to be here for a while. <laughs> now, I saw Steve Joyce, who um, was instrumental in helping me uh, get my first uh, Marriott property in Washington, D.C., the courtyard uh, by Marriott. And Steve told me he got the uh, Chairman's Award. He wondered what that meant. And I saw Raul Thomas earlier and getting the Deal of the Year Award. And what did that mean? Did that mean that these, they were in the twilight of their careers? Um, was, was, were, were this a retirement or, or send-off? Well, I got Deal of the Year, and I got Chairman of the Year, and I'm still kicking. Now, I'd lost a lot of weight, so Andy probably thought I was in bad health, so he figured it better honor me. But I think, Steve, we're safe here uh, for the moment, and you are safe, and you got a lot of work ahead of you and what you're doing. And as you notice, he left D.C., so his suits got a little lighter, a little more blue, and his shoes changed. Now, I can say that about Norm as well, but end of the day, now, I spend, I've been spending more and more time in and Beverly Hills, too, because I'm building what hopefully will be the tallest building in the western United States in downtown L.A. So I promise my wife, every time I come back, I'm a, she's going to get the same guy that left New York. I'm going to come back. But I may have dinner with Steve, so I can't be responsible for what happens next. <laughs> so, by the way, I'm, I refer to my wife, and I want to say something also, is that um, I'm the person I am because of two people. Um, my mother, who gave birth to me, raised me, and taught me the real estate business, by the way, as a black woman uh, trying to break, break barriers in Detroit, Michigan, and Washington, D.C., and then my wife, Katrina, who made me a better person, because clearly when she met me, I was a work in progress, and so required a great deal of patience, nurturing, and support, um, including encouraging me to keep fighting to build um, the Royal Palm Hotel and all these other projects that we've done over the years, so thank you, Katrina. Um, on my way over here, I was talking to a friend of mine, another lawyer. Uh, by the way, what happens, as you all know, when you're in the real estate and hotel business, you know a lot of lawyers. <laughs> and it's a relationship-oriented business, right? So you become friends with some of these lawyers and so forth. I've been friends with a few of mine. And so I told one of my lawyers, I'm coming over here again to speak and give a keynote at lunch and wonder why they wanted me, because what could I possibly say? to warrant giving the uh, keynote address. I'm just a little run-of-the-mill developer. And so my friend told me, actually, I didn't deserve it, and I probably should just get him, have, tell him to get somebody else who would have a better message. So it reminded me of this story of a developer who died. And this developer dies, and he reports to the pearly gates, and he's greeted by St. Peter. St. Peter checks his dossier, looks there, says, developer, your name's not on the list. Developer figured as much, so he reports to the gates of hell. And Satan welcomes him with open arms. Come on in. So after about two or three months, the developer gets a bit uncomfortable with his surroundings. So he starts making some improvements. Pretty soon, he's installed escalators, flushing toilets, air conditioning. So pretty soon, the developer is a pretty popular guy down in hell. So one day, uh, the phone rings. Um, and God, uh, Satan's sitting by the fireside, and the phone rings, and it's God. And God says to Satan, how's it going down there in hell? Satan says, you know, actually, not too bad. We got air conditioning. We got flushing toilets. 
you know, we got escalators. Who knows what this developer is going to come up with next? And, and God says, you have a developer? You shouldn't have a developer. That's a mistake. Send him back up here immediately. And Satan says, no way. I like having a developer on staff. In fact, I'm keeping him. And God said, if you don't send him up here right this minute, I'm going to sue. <laughs> and Satan starts laughing euphorically and says, oh, yeah? Well, where are you going to get the lawyers? <laughs> I'm sorry, Daryl. All right, so now give a little levity to the afternoon before we walk into some more of a serious topic. So as I said, first of all, it's good to be back here in Miami, even with the heat in the end of July. Good news is I'll be gone by August. Not to New York, though. Um, so I started doing business in 1996 in Miami. I moved my family here in 1997 and I built the nation's then first major hotel developed and owned by an African-American. In 2003, I became chairman of the board of directors of the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. This is the organization that leads the tourism industry for Greater Miami and makes Greater Miami a destination globally. I was the first African-American to head the organization. That same year, the NAACP held its national convention in Miami Beach. Miami hosting the NAACP for its national convention was seen as a watershed moment for Miami, illustrating the region's relationship with the NAACP had come full circle. What was the circle, you ask? And I'll tell you about it, because my journey was a part of it. To put this transition in clear perspective, we need to step back in time. In June of 1990, anti-apartheid leader Nelson Mandela planned to visit Miami four months after being freed from prison in South Africa. The Miami city government made plans to present him with honors fitting his status as a global leader up for freedom. The plan recognition included a key to the city and a proclamation. But during a television interview prior to his upcoming Miami visit, Mandela acknowledged the support he received as a political prisoner from then Cuba leader Fidel Castro. The Miami City Commission rescinded the official welcome to Mandela in retaliation. So black leaders were furious with this insult to Mandela and warned Miami commissioners that if Mandela did not receive the official welcome, African Americans would call for a boycott of Miami. So when the black community's appeals and threat were ignored, an organization of black leaders led by attorneys H.T. Smith and Marilyn Holifield called for the threatened boycott immediately. Shortly thereafter, the National Bar Association, the ACLU, and other organizations canceled their Miami conventions. The NAACP joined the boycott and many other organizations refused to hold meetings, conferences, or conventions in Miami. By the time the boycott ended on May 12, 1992, the city had lost over $100 million in revenue and had become an outcast among the nation's cities. The settlement of this boycott included the creation of single member city and county commission districts the creation of the Visitors Industry Council, and the creation of a scholarship program at Florida International University School of Hospitality Management for African-American students from Miami-Dade County. There were many other concessions made by the city and county, one of them being the support of an African-American-owned hotel in Miami Beach. This is where my path pierces the circle I mentioned. The city of Miami Beach, along with Miami-Dade County, had already committed $70 million to support the development of a convention hotel in South Beach. And they now agreed to allocate $10 million of those funds to support the development of an African-American-owned hotel. After an unsuccessful initial effort, the city issued a new request for proposals to develop the Royal Palm Hotel with majority African-American ownership. I was a 36-year-old developer from Washington, D.C., married for four years and the father of a two-year-old son. While in our vacation apartment, 
on Miami Beach for a post-Christmas vacation, I read the Miami Herald Sunday edition. It was New Year's Eve, 1995. I read an article that mentioned the upcoming RFP, and I immediately called the broker who found our apartment for us and had him get a copy of the RFP the day it was issued and to show me the adjacent property so I could go and acquire it. I put the adjacent property under contract and put together a team of diverse and talented professionals. I remember flying back on American Airlines from Miami back to DC and telling Katrina that we were gonna respond to this RFP, we were gonna win the RFP, and it was gonna change our lives and change the trajectory of our company. But I wanted to do something transformational given the political backdrop and subsequently submitted a proposal for a 100% African-American owned hotel, a feat never before accomplished. So here we all were on paper and teamed together to bid for ownership. And I'll talk a little bit more about ownership in a moment. After a very hard fought battle, we won the RFP on the Royal Palm on June 6, 1996 the City Commission of Miami Beach voted to award us the opportunity to build the first black-owned hotel in the United States. <laughs> On May 16th of 2002, the Royal Palm Hotel and Resort opened its doors. That was the first major hotel in the United States developed and owned 100% by African Americans. It was a day of great pride for the city, the community, black America, my family, and for me. And to paraphrase the, na the late Neil Armstrong, it was one small step for Miami, one giant leap for black entrepreneurship. This was 17 years ago, and great progress has been made in America since then. Six years after the Royal Palm was opened, 40 blocks north on the same street, I hosted then Senator Barack Obama at another barrier breaking project of mine, the Bath Club. The Bath Club is a resort I developed on the Atlantic Ocean on the grounds of a once racially segregated private beach club. In fact, I was the first African American member to join that club. A few months after we hosted Obama, he became America's first African American president. At that moment in time, I was never more optimistic. America was finally turning the page on racial disparity and ending the obstruction of black progress. Progress locked down from 246 years of slavery and 142 years subsequent for of second class citizenship was limited to no economic opportunity. While slavery and legally imposed segregation was in our rear view, we continued the great struggle for economic equality. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once concluded, what does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't have enough money to buy a hamburger? And therein lies the challenge that we face in America today. African Americans claim only a fraction of the wealth of our white counterparts. In 2016, the median wealth for non-retired African Americans was $13,460. That's less than one-tenth of the median wealth of $142,000 for our white Americans. This same year, black home ownership fell to a 50-year low of 42% which is 31% lower than white home ownership, which reached 72% at the same time. Fast forward two years and the black home ownership rate grew slightly to 44% and white home ownership grew to 74%. This wealth disparity is directly reflective of home ownership and business ownership disparities that, concur that currently exist without money we cannot buy homes or start businesses. In 1968, near the end of the civil rights movement, the median African American family income was 57% of their white counterparts. In 2016, the ratio was 56%. Think about that. 
50 years later, the disparity actually increased. Today, black-owned businesses represent approximately 2% of all U.S. businesses. This is essentially the same percentage of black hotel ownership. The pillars of democracy is equality. Black Americans represent 13% of our nation's population. Therefore, if opportunity is available on an equal basis, then the overall economic metrics should be reflective of the population demographics. Agree? What are the biggest obstacles we confront in the pursuit of economic success? I was told a long time ago, in our capitalistic democracy, ownership is the essence of power. And I believe this to be true. Therefore, if black ownership is measured at less than 2%, which is just 15% of our population demographic, it serves to follow that we are essentially powerless when it comes to determining our future outcomes. However, America is a democracy, and our population, especially in major urban markets, is significant and often dominant. Working together, we have great political power. With these statistical challenges, you may ask, is there any hope? How do we change this? Here's the answer. We exercise our political power to ensure we invest in more black-owned businesses. We need black-owned businesses to reflect the population percentages. It is black-owned businesses who most often provide jobs, career, and contracting opportunities to other African-American businesses and, on and entrepreneurs. Black-owned businesses are more likely to invest in our own communities. So what's the solution to significantly multiplying the number of black businesses and growing the existing black businesses that currently are operating today? The answer is very, very simple. Capital. We all know that money is the fuel that powers the engines of business. And unfortunately, black businesses essentially have no access to investment capital to grow their businesses. Interesting study, Guidance Financial in 2018 did a survey of 2,600 black business owners, and it showed that over 80% said the number one challenge was access to capital. Recent studies have concluded that less than two-tenths of 1% of venture capital dollars go to businesses started by black women. Less than two-tenths of 1%. Black entrepreneurs are forced to rely upon their own resources to fund their businesses. In fact, 70% of those surveyed in that study used their own capital to start their companies, and 23% received investments from friends and families. Now, in my industry, the commercial real estate industry, there are only a handful of large-scale African-American developers nationally, and not many more small and mid-sized developers. And this is ironic because there are very few educational or technical uh, skill barriers to enter into commercial real estate development. That's probably why I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> so, so this can't be the reason. These barriers to entry educationally cannot be the reason. I want to give you some perspective on this. Two of the top New York City developers, one of them building the tallest residential building in New York City today, one started out as a taxi cab driver, another one as a wig salesman from his living room of his apartment. Three legendary Washington, D.C. developers who mentored me started their careers as a parking lot attendant, hotel busboy, and janitor. So real estate development is a low barrier to entry field. So why are there so few black or women developers? Capital and access to it. The same can be said regarding hotel ownership. As you all know, developing a hotel is a real estate action. Developers build hotels and hire operators to run them, operators like Hilton and Marriott and so many others. That's, why most developer, that's what most developers have done, and that's how most hotels get built. But without capital, um, it's impossible to do. But nothing gets built without 
having access to capital and the ability to raise equity. On larger developments, the equity comes from private equity firms. Development is a leveraged business, and it's rare for a large-scale development project for a developer to fund more than 20% of the project's equity. Say, for example, let's take a project that's $100 million. A $100 million project would be financed with 70% senior debt and $30 million of equity. The developer would contribute 10 to 20% of that equity, so three to six million dollars to build a hundred million dollar project. The other 80% or 90% of equity most often comes from private equity funds, generally owned and operated by Wall Street firms. Now here's the hidden secret. The money contributed by Wall Street firms more often than not is not their own money. Think about that, not their own money. And I know there's some private equity funds in here as well, and I'm sure they would agree. Um, it's generally the money from governmental, manufacturing, service worker, retirement pension funds, and other pension systems. So yes, it's the money of working men and women. A large percentage of pension contributors are black and brown people of color, and a larger percentage are women. Yet less than one-tenth of one percent of all private equity into the real estate market goes into projects developed and owned by African-American developers. I mean, this is an alarming statistic. And it leads us to the key solution to closing the wealth and income disparities that African-Americans confront. The solution is unlocking the money doors to deploy our own people's pension money into some of our own businesses. The time has never been better. African-American voters are a powerful voting bloc, and as I stated earlier, often a strong majority who can often determine the outcome of elections. The nation has recently been more focused on economic equality, and the chairwoman of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee in charge of regulating the financial services industry is an African-American woman from California, Maxine Waters. And in Chairperson Waters' first press release as chairperson of the House Financial Services Committee, she indicated that the top of the agenda was providing access to capital for African-American entrepreneurs. She did this same thing when she was in the state legislature, when she forced the California state pension systems to hire African-American and minority and women investment advisors. So what's important here is we must now spread the word that we want access to capital. It's our money too, and we want our fair share of capital. We must educate our community and our entrepreneurs that there is a solution, and it's tangible, it's right there in our grasp. We must tell the politicians we want access to capital and they must fight for it until they get it for us. And if they don't, we will vote in someone else who will. We must exercise our political might and make consequences, sort of like the boycott that was done here in Miami-Dade. It made its point and sent a message. So until we effectively get fairness, we've got to fight for it. We all must do our part in this fight for economic justice. We live in a democracy, so you all have a part. Contact your state and city controllers and treasurers and demand allocation of capital to black-owned businesses. Demand that the capital be deployed into the communities where the people who've earned it live. I guarantee you, if every participant paying into a worker's pension system knew that their money was being invested primarily by white men who give it to other white male-run companies, they would be outraged. It's their pension money and their communities, and they are empowered to demand where and how it's deployed. They just don't know. But now, we all know, 
and we must do our part and demand action from our political leaders. I'm doing my part. My company has de a development project pipeline of over $4 billion from Boston to Florida to downtown Los Angeles, and, and we have made a firm commitment that 35% of all of our contracts will be with minority and women-owned businesses. As a black developer, I know firsthand the number one obstacle to growing our business has been and continues to be access to capital. Therefore, my company is in the process of raising a private equity fund to support emerging developers, a fund whose sole purpose is to provide capital and hard-to-find equity to minority and women entrepreneurs. And by the way, while that is a good thing, this fund is not a philanthropic effort, but a great business model. The projects developed by minority and women-owned businesses in our major cities more often produce higher rates of return than the large deals developed by top-tier developers. So go ahead, you can clap because that's the truth. And of course, because the opportunities are so hard fought, African Americans and women will do a better job because they know there is no second chance. Our fund will prove that providing capital to a diverse group of entrepreneurs reflective of our nation's population will produce superior returns. So it's up to all of us to close the economic divide. So as Barack Obama once said, Change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change we seek. It is my honor to share some of my journey with you this afternoon in the hopes that it will inspire you to continue to actively endeavor for positive change. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Don. That was, uh, that was awesome. Let's give him one more round of applause. Okay, we started a little late. We're still running behind just a bit. Uh, the next sessions are going to start right now. I just had one housekeeping item. Yesterday during the opening reception, Mitch Miller talked about the NAB Hood Scholarship Fund. Uh, there's a sign-up list right outside the door for those who want to participate in the Scholarship Fund breakfast, which is tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. in the Fisher Room, the Fisher Room. Uh, sign up, uh, those scholarship dollars are very important and really supports everything we've talked about today, including some of the uh, initiatives that uh, Don discussed with emerging developers. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Hilton. Have a good rest of the afternoon. <laughs>